Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and I'm here on Friday, June 12th with another of our Baltimore Heritage 5-Minute Histories videos. And I am really pleased that today we're going to focus on one of our 20, uh, 2020 Preservation Award winners and that's the restoration of Maryland Hall in the Johns Hopkins Homewood campus. And we're going to get to that, but let's first start out and talk about how we got a Maryland Hall and in fact how we even got a Homewood campus for Hopkins University. Um, and let me just start out by saying my name is Johns Hopkins and I am talking about Johns Hopkins University. Um, there is a relation but it is very very distant. Uh, for those of you who are genealogists I believe that the famous Hopkins the philanthropist who gave seven million dollars to found the hospital and the university. Um, he His grandparents were my great grandparents to something like the seventh power. So, um, so there you go. There's the connection. Um, but let's talk about how we got a Hopkins. It was the gift of Johns Hopkins. Um, um, back in 1876 is when the university was founded. And Hopkins had specified in his will that he wanted the university and hospital to be located on his summer estate at Clifton, which we covered in a prior video. Um, uh, but his trustees, or at least the majority of his trustees, thought otherwise. Um, they had the philosophy that they were going to, and the quote is, invest in men, not buildings. Um, and in, uh, in creating the university, they put their money where their mouth was, and they uh, put up enough money to lure the best and the brightest in fields like physics and chemistry and mathematics and classics. Um, the trustees who argued to not build a new campus at Clifton were also aided by a couple of things. One was that Hopkins' $7 million gift was largely in B&O railroad stock that had tanked. And so the amount of money that the trustees had for a new, creating a new university was not nearly what they thought they had. Um, and the second thing is that Hopkins in his will had specified that the trustees were to spend only the income from his gift, not the principal on building buildings. Um, so uh, in, a, in a way, he actually made it possible to not have the university uh, on his Clifton estate. So the university starts out in 1876 uh, in downtown Baltimore along in buildings along Howard Street, first rented and then they built a little campus. But by around the turn of the century, they realized that they didn't have enough room to grow. And they looked at Clifton uh, as a possible campus at that point, uh, but already the city had taken over 30 acres for a public park, and it didn't seem central enough. And so um, uh, a number of the trustees set out to find a new campus. And they came across Homewood, which was the uh, originally the estate of Charles Carroll of Carrollton's son. Um, it was a gift from uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Uh, uh, if you know Homewood Mansion, Homewood House, um, that's the house. Charles Carroll of Carrollton, incidentally, was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He was the wealthiest signer, the only Catholic signer, and the longest lived signer. And we will definitely have to do a video on his house, um, the Carroll Mansion on Lombard and Front Street. So stay tuned for that. Um, but if you know Homewood House, that was uh, the center of the Homewood estate. By the 1850s, uh, the Wyman family had acquired Homewood. Um, and the Wyman family built a wonderful Italianate villa um, uh, elsewhere on the estate. Um, and they had been occupying it happily um, until again around the turn of the century when a, a gentleman named William Wyman um, became fascinated by in, in trying to help Hopkins build a campus. And, um, with the help of a number of trustees and important businessmen in the, uh, in the, in the era, um, in his will in 1902 or 1903, I forget which date, um, he gave over his estate to Hopkins to start a campus um, and as well gave another million dollars to help build it out. So now we get to uh, Maryland Hall. Maryland Hall was completed uh, in 1914, we believe, and there's a little bit of a debate on uh, which came first, Maryland Hall or uh, Gilman Hall, named after Daniel. Coit Gilman, the uh, first president of Hopkins, um, uh, they both had their dedications on the exact same day in 1915. So that's not uh, that's not super helpful. Um, and uh, Gilman Hall is widely regarded as the first building at Hopkins, and it certainly is right in the center. Uh, but there's a little bit of evidence that in fact uh, Maryland Hall, which was first called um, uh, the Mechanical and Electrical Engineering Building, uh, uh, was actually had students occupying it 
it first. So it might have been the first uh, building in use at any rate. At any rate, um, and regardless, it is certainly the the its towering spire is certainly the center and the dominant of uh, point on the campus. Um, in 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 its opening ceremony in 1915, um, none other than a gentleman named uh, uh, Major General George Girdles uh, was the keynote speaker. For those of you who like the Panama Canal, Girdles was the chief engineer and oversaw the completion of the canal. So uh, in the engineering world, this new engineering school that Hopkins was creating and the new hall that uh, the building and the hall that it was getting, uh, you couldn't have a better speaker than Girdles. Um, and that and the hall has been operating ever since 1915 or even maybe a little before it. Um, but by uh, 2019, it needed a lot of work. And uh, the construction team of Lewis contractors and their folks were brought in by Hopkins uh, to take a look. At first, they thought maybe it needed just some cosmetic repairs. Uh, but they found pretty quickly that it was uh, both the metal and the wood were severely deteriorated. And uh, the construction project took on a life of its own. Um, uh, the scaffolding alone uh, that sort of uh, circumnavigated the building up to, up to the top of the spire uh, was worthy of the engineering school that it was restoring. Um, some of the uh, wild parts of the project, um, in addition to the scaffolding, were that uh, the work was going to take place and did take place while students were in the building uh, in their classes. Um, uh, so that meant all en entrances and exits and all of that had to be kept open. And it also meant that the construction crew could only work from 5 a.m. Uh, till I think 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning. So they had a, a, a early morning, but, uh, but that was it. And the other wild thing was that uh, the hall, Maryland Hall, uh, which was renamed in the 1950s uh, for the state's support for the engineering school, um, uh, was uh, is in the middle of campus and not accessible by any uh, uh, truck or car. So all of the materials had to be taken by hand carts uh, from a parking lot over to the over to the hall. I think it, even the original uh, builders had it made, uh, had it way easier than that. So I want to say in wrapping up to, uh, to uh, say congratulations to all of the folks who were involved in this restoration work. Um, it was definitely a labor of love, and that shows. Uh, it was also a it, it is also um, an example of the highest level of uh, artisanship and craftsmanship and care. And I think we can safely say that we look forward to another 100 years of Maryland Hall and its wonderful spire dominating the Hopkins campus. Thanks so much and have a good weekend.